so long a letter by. Mariama Bardiere Satu, continued chapter 8 Then came your marriage with Mordo Bar, recently graduated from the African School of Medicine and Pharmacy. A controversial marriage. I can still hear the angry rumors in town. What? A Taukula marrying Goldsmith's daughter. He will never make money. Mordo's mother is a diaphine, a galibu from the sign. What an insult to her, before her former co-wives. Mordo's father was dead. In the desire to marry a short skirt come what may, this is what one gets. School turns our girls into devils who lure our men away from the right path. And I haven't recounted all. But Mordo remained firm. Marriage is a personal thing, he retorted to anyone who cared to hear. He emphasized his total commitment to his choice of life partner by visiting your father, not at home, but at his place of work. He would return from his outings illuminated, happy to have moved in the right direction, he would say triumphantly. He would speak of your father as a creative artist. He admired the man, weakened as he was by the daily dose of carbon dioxide he inhaled working in the acrid atmosphere of the dusty fumes. Gold is his medium, which he melts, pours, twists, flatterns, refines, chases. You should see him, Mordo would add. You should see him breathe over the flame. His cheeks would swell with the life from his lungs. This life would animate the flame, sometimes red, sometimes blue, which would rise or curve, wax, or wane at his command, depending on what the work demanded. And the gold specks in the showers of red sparks, and the uncouth songs of the apprentices punctuating the strokes of the hammer here, and the pressure of hands on the bellows there would make passers-by turn around. Asa too. Your father knew all the rights that protect the working of gold, the metal of the jinns. Each profession has its code, known only to the initiated and transmitted from father to son. As soon as your elder brothers left the huts of the circumcised, they moved into this particular world, the whole compound source of nourishment. But what about your younger brothers? Their steps are directed towards a white man's school. Hard is the climb up the steeple of knowledge to the white man's school. Kindergarten remains a luxury that only those who are financially sound can offer their young ones. Yet it is necessary, for this is what sharpens and channels the young ones' is attention and sensibilities. Even though the primary schools are rapidly increasing, Access to them has not become any easier. They leave out in the streets an impressive number of children, because of the lack of places. Entrance into a secondary school is no panacea for the child at an age fraught with the problems of consolidating his personality, with the explosion of puberty, with the discovery of the various pitfalls. Drugs, vagrancy, sensuality. The university has its own large number of despairing rejects. What will the unsuccessful do? Apprenticeship to traditional crafts seems degrading to whoever has the slightest book learning. The dream is to become a clerk. The trowel is spurned. The hoard of the jobless swells the flood of delinquency. Should we have been happy at the desertion of the forges, the workshops? The shoemaker's shops. Should we have rejoiced so wholeheartedly? Were we not beginning to witness the disappearance of an elite of traditional manual workers? Eternal questions of our eternal debates. We all agreed that much dismantling was needed to introduce modernity within our traditions. Torn between the past and the present, we deplored the hard sweat that would be inevitable. We counted the possible losses. But we knew that nothing would be as before. We were full of nostalgia, but were resolutely progressive. Chapter 9 Mordo raised you up to his own level. 
he the son of a princess and your child from the forges. His mother's rejection did not frighten him. Our lives developed in parallel. We experienced the tiffs and reconciliations of married life. In our different ways, we suffered the social constraints and heavy burden of custom. I loved Modu. I compromised with his people. I tolerated his sisters, who too often would desert their own homes to encumber my own. They allowed themselves to be fed and petted. They would look on, without reacting, as their children romped around on my chairs. I tolerated their spitting, the phlegm expertly secreted under my carpets. His mother would stop by again and again, while on her outings. Always flanked by different friends, just to show off her son's social success, but particularly so that they might see, at close quarters, her supremacy in this beautiful house in which she did not live. I would receive her with all the respect due to your queen, and she would leave satisfied, especially if her hand closed over the banknote I had carefully placed there. But hardly would she be out than she would think of the new band of friends she would soon be dazzling. Modu's father was more understanding. More often than not, he would visit us without sitting down. He would accept a glass of cold water and would leave, after repeating his prayers for the protection of the house. I knew how to smile at them all, and consented to wasting useful time in futile chatter. My sisters-in-law, believe me to be spared the drudgery of housework. With your two housemaids, they would say with emphasis. Try explaining to them, that a working woman is no less responsible for her home. Try explaining to them, that nothing is done, if you do not step in, that you have to see to everything, do everything all over again. Cleaning up, cooking, ironing. There are the children to be washed, the husband to be looked after. The working woman has a dual task, of which both halves, equally arduous, must be reconciled. How does one go about this? Therein lies the skill, that makes all the difference to a home. Some of my sisters-in-law, did not envy my way of living at all. They saw me dashing around the house after a hard day at school. They appreciated their comfort, their peace of mind, their moments of leisure, and allowed themselves to be looked after by their husbands, who were crushed under their duties. Others, limited in their way of thinking, envied my comfort and purchasing power. They would go into raptures over the many gadgets in my house. Gas cooker, vegetable grater, sugar tongs. They forgot the source of this easy life. First up in the morning, last to go to bed, always working. You, Acer too, you forsook your family-in-law, tightly shut in with their hurt dignity. You would lament to me. Your family-in-law respects you. You must treat them well. As for me... They look down on me from the height of their lost nobility. What can I do? While Mordo's mother planned her revenge, we lived. Christmas Eve parties organized by several couples, with the costs shared equally, and held in turns in the different homes. Without self-consciousness, we would revive the dances of yesteryear. The live begin. Frenzied rambas. Languid tangos. We rediscovers the old beatings of the heart, that strengthened the feelings. We would also leave the stifling city, to breathe in the healthy air of seaside suburbs. We would walk along the dark Arkornich, one of the most beautiful in West Africa, a sheer work of art wrought by nature. Rounded or pointed rocks, black or archer-colored, overlooking the ocean. Greenery. Sometimes a veritable hanging garden spread out under the clear sky. We would go on to the road to Awakum, which also leads to Ngor, and further on to Yoff Airport. 
we would recognize on the way the narrow road leading farther on to Almadiz Beach. Our favorite spot was Ngor Beach, situated near the village of the same name, where old bearded fishermen repaired their nets under the silk cotton trees. Naked and snotty children played in complete freedom when they were not frolicking about in the sea. On the fine sand, washed by the waves and swollen with water, naively painted canoes awaited their turn to be launched into the waters. In their hollows small pools of blue water would glisten, full of light from the sky and sun. What a crowd on public holidays! Numerous families would stroll about, thirsty for space and fresh air. People would undress, without embarrassment, tempted by the benevolent caress of the iodized breeze, and warmth from the sun's rays. The idle would sleep under spread parasols. A few children, spade and bucket in hand, would build and demolish the castles of their imagination. In the evening the fishermen would return from their laborious outings. Once more, they had escaped the moving snare of the sea. At first simple points on the horizon, the boats would become more distinct from one another as they drew nearer. They would dance in the hollows of the waves then would lazily let themselves be dragged along. Fishermen would gaily furl their sails and draw in their tackle. While some of them would gather together the wriggling catch, others would wring out their soaked clothes and mop their faces. Under the wandering gaze of the kids, the live fish would flip up as the long sea snakes would curve themselves inwards. There is nothing more beautiful than a fish just out of water. Its eye clear and fresh, with golden or silver ray scales and beautiful bluish glints. Hands would sort out, group, divide. We would buy a good selection at bargain prices for the house. The sea air would put us in good humor. The pleasure we indulged in and in which all our senses rejoiced would intoxicate both rich and poor with health. Our communion was deep bottomless and unlimited nature refreshed our souls. Depression and sadness would disappear, suddenly to be replaced by feelings of plenitude and expansiveness. Reinvigorated, we would set out for home. How jealously we guarded the secret of simple pleasures, health-giving remedy for the daily tensions of life. Do you remember the picnics we organized at San Galcom? in the farm Mordo Bar inherited from his father. Sangalcom remains the refuge of people from Dakar, those who want a break from the frenzy of the city. The younger set, in particular, has bought land there and built country residences. These green, open spaces are conducive to rest, meditation and the letting off of steam by children. This oasis lies on the road to Rufisk. Mordo's mother had looked after the farm before her son's marriage. The memory of her husband had made her attached to this plot of land, where their joint and patient hands had disciplined the vegetation that filled our eyes with admiration. Yourself, you added the small building at the far end. Three small simple bedrooms, a bathroom, a kitchen, you grew many flowers in a few corners. You had a hen run built, then a closed pen for sheep. Coconut trees, with their interlacing leaves, gave protection from the sun. Succulent sapodilla stood next to sweet-smelling pomegranates. Heavy mangoes weighed down the branches. Pawpaws resembling breasts of different shapes hung tempting and inaccessible from the tops of elongated trunks. Green leaves and brown leaves, new grass and withered grass were strewn all over the ground. Under our feet the ants untiringly built and rebuilt their homes. How warm the shades over the camp beds. Teams for games were formed one after the other amid cries of victory or lamentations of defeat. And we stuffed ourselves with fruits within easy reach and we drank the milk from coconuts, and we told juicy stories. 
and we danced about, roused by the strident notes of ramophone. And the lamb, seasoned with white pepper, garlic, butter, hot pepper, would be roasting over the wood fire. And we lived. When we stood in front of our overcrowded classes, we represented a force in the enormous effort to be accomplished, in order to overcome ignorance. Each profession, intellectual or manual, deserves consideration, whether it requires painful physical effort or manual dexterity, wide knowledge or the patience of an ant. Ours, like that of the doctor, does not allow for any mistake. You don't joke with life, and life is both body and mind. To warp a soul is as much a sacrilege as murder. Teachers at kindergarten level, as at university level form a noble army accomplishing daily feats, never praised, never decorated. An army forever on the move, forever vigilant. An army without drums, without gleaming uniforms. This army, thwarting traps and snares, everywhere plants the flag of knowledge and morality. How we loved this priesthood, humble teachers in humble local schools. How faithfully we served our profession, and how we spent ourselves, in order to do it honor. Like all apprentices, we had learned how to practice it well at the demonstration school, a few steps away from our own, where experienced teachers taught the novices, that we were how to apply, in the lessons we gave, our knowledge of psychology and method, in those children we set in motion waves that, breaking, carried away in their furl a bit of ourselves. Chapter 10 Modu rose steadily to the top rank in the trade union organizations. His understanding of people and things he an optional hyphen endeared him to both employers and workers. He focused his efforts on points that were easily satisfied, that made work lighter and life more pleasant. He sought practical IMPROVE optional hyphen ments in the workers' conditions. His slogan was, What's the use of taunting with the impossible? Obtaining the possible is already a victory. His point of view was not unanimously accepted, but people relied on his practical realism. Mordo could take part in neither trade unionism nor politics, for he hadn't the time underscore his reputation as a good doctor was growing. He remained the prisoner of his mission in a hospital filled to capacity with the sick, for people were going less and less to the native doctor who specialized in brewing the same concoctions of leaves for different illnesses. Everybody was reading newspapers and magazines. There was unrest in North Africa. Did these interminable discussions, during which points of view concurred or clashed, complemented each other or were vanquished, determined the aspect of the new Africa. The assimilationist dream of the colonist drew into its crucible our mode of thought and way of life. The sun helmet worn over the natural protection of our kinky hair. Smoke fill lead pipe in the mouth, white shorts just above the calves, very short dresses displaying shapely legs. A whole generation suddenly became aware of the ridiculous situation festering in our midst. History marched on, inexorably. The debate over the right path to take shook West Africa. Brave men went to prison. Others, following in their footsteps, continued the work begun. It was the privilege of our generation to be the link between two periods in our history one of domination, the other of independence. We remained young and efficient, for we were the messengers of a new design. With independence achieved, we witnessed the birth of a republic, the birth of an anthem and the implantation of a flag. I heard people repeat that all the active forces in the country should be mobilized. And we said that over and above the unavoidable opting for such and such a party, such and such a model of society, what was needed was national unity. 
Many of us rallied around the dominant party, infusing it with new blood. To be productive in the crowd was better than crossing one's arms and hiding behind imported ideologies. Modu, a practical man, led his unions into collaboration with the government, demanding for his troops only what was possible. But like cursed the hasty establishment of too many embassies, which he judged to be too costly for our underdeveloped country. This bleeding of the country for reasons of pure vanity, among other things, such as the frequent invitation of foreigners, was just a waste of money. And, with his way journeys in mind, he would repeatedly growl, so many schools, or so much hospital equipment lost, so many monthly wage increases, so many tarred roads. You and Morda would listen to him. We were scaling the heights, but your mother-in-law, who saw you resplendent beside her son, who saw her son going more and more frequently to your father's workshop, who saw your mother fill out and dress better, your mother-in-law thought more and more of her revenge, 